Okay. Um, so again, you know, if you have to unmute yourself, uh, push star six so that will allow you to be uh, heard. Um, okay. So the motivation for for this algorithm is this: if you have a collection of documents find pairs of documents that are similar. Now, if the number of documents is small, if the sizes are small, uh, this is easy. You know, one can just do it uh, on a single node. You don't need a cluster. Um, and if there are uh, a large number of documents, you know, even if there are a million documents, uh, the number of comparisons that you need to do would be about half a trillion. Um, and if it takes just a microsecond to process a pair of documents, you would still need about six or seven days to complete the, complete the uh, process. Now, now that, that's really big, and, and uh, if, if you, if you just want to parallelize this, uh, you can run it in parallel, but still, you know, you'd need a lot of processing power and stuff like that. Now, uh, the algorithm that's presented here will just uh, simplify uh, the the process. You know, there are some hashing mechanisms that you can use to actually uh, uh, to actually throw away the sets that. Uh, you don't have to even uh, process. Um, now, this is the reference. Uh, it's a very nice uh, book. It's a free download. Uh, it's called Mining of Massive Datasets. And uh, you know what I'm going uh, to present is actually in Chapter 3 of this. And this is the URL mmds.org. Now, uh, the concept is based on a very simple, uh, you, know, uh, you know, intersection and union of sets. Like if you have uh, two sets, you can say that they are similar if the overlap between them is large, and so when you when you say overlap, you are actually talking about intersection of two sets. And uh, a Jacquard similarity is actually defined this way: if you have two sets S and T, Jacquard similarity is actually the size of S intersection T divided by the size of S union T. So it uh, so as you can see, if uh, if there is no overlap at all between the sets, you have this as zero, and if the sets overlap completely, uh, this will be one. So so you'll you'll get a number between zero and one as the Jacquard similarity. So so if you're talking about document similarities between many many pairs of documents, you will actually set a threshold like. Uh, let's say 0 0.4 or something like that, and uh, you will basically say uh, if the Jacquard similarity is greater than 0 0.4, I would call the sets similar, or I'll call the document similar. So, the, so the, that's the idea, and uh, we need to have this run on many many pairs of documents, and that's where this algorithm comes in. Now the big picture is this. Uh, I'll explain all these terms eventually. Uh, so if you have a document, we will actually run a process called shingling of that document, and that creates a set of uh, substrings uh, that we will work with. So. So basically, you will identify a number k, and you will collect all substrings of length k. 
So that means uh, you know you'll if you'll start with uh, the zeroth character in the document. So zero to k minus one and one to k, two to k plus one, etc. So you'll you'll basically have uh, if the document size is n, so you'll have n minus k plus one shingles uh, or substrings for the document, and each of those substrings uh, is called uh, is called a shingle. And once you have that, uh, working with shingles uh, is not a good idea. I mean, if you have a document of size n, uh, you will you will actually have n minus k plus one shingles, and shingles are basically substrings. So uh, n minus k, well, k is very small compared to n. So the number of shingles is almost of the order of uh, the, the size of the document in uh, in uh, number of characters and uh, uh if if each substring is of length k you have k times the size of the document so uh, so the set that you're considering you know will have k times n uh as the size uh, of the number of characters that you have and uh and if you have again a million documents, you are looking at a huge size. So we cannot work with that unless we employ something else to reduce the uh, the size of uh, data that we need to work with. Um, so for that, we we employ a method called min hashing. So if you if you basically have a set of shingles. Uh, we replace this set of shingles with what's known as uh, a min hash of those shingles, and uh, the min hash basically is a signature that identifies uh, that set. And we'll uh, we'll go through what min hashing is. And so once you have min hashing, like if you even if you have a million min hashes, it's still a large set. And uh, uh, the, if there is a method of, uh, if there's a way to throw away uh, a lot of unlikely pairs, you know, that would be the best thing to do because you don't want to process uh, checking if, uh, you know, uh, a pair of documents are similar if they're very unlikely to be similar. And uh, to to that effect, you know, we'll run an algorithm called locality locality sensitive hashing. And uh, this will identify candidate pairs that are really likely to be similar. And so once you get there, you know, you will have a lot less number of pairs to actually check. And, uh, you know, th that's where we actually go check the uh, similarity between pairs and, uh, and, confirm, and confirm whether a pair of documents are similar or not. So, so this is basically the process. So, the, uh, so what goes, what happens next is, you know, we will uh, we'll just uh, go through the details of these three algorithms. Um, a variant of Jacquard similarity is actually called Jacquard bag similarity. So. Uh, you, you are viewing the set of shingles as a set, but you can also view them as a collection where shingles can be repeated. For example, you know, in a document, you you may have the same shingle repeated many times, and if you consider that as a set, you are not allowing a duplicate uh, shingles in, in that collection, and. Uh, if you allow that, what you'll see is uh, uh, what what comes after that is known as bag similarity. We'll not be using bag similarity in the algorithm. But just to give an illustration of what Jacquard similarity is and what Jacquard bag, bag similarity is, you know, uh, this is how it is. So if you have two sets, so, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F as one set, A, C, E, F, G, H, I, J as the other, you'll see that the intersection is A, C, F, and this is the union, and Jacquard similarity is 3 by 10. 
for if you have two sets like this, uh, in a bag similarity, you will actually consider duplications as well. So uh, in this, you'll basically see that it's um, one by three in this case. But this just to illustrate what how bag similarity is different from jacquard similarity. Now, shingling, as I said, is a collection of substrings. So you would, you would consider document as a large character string. And a K shingle is any substring of length K in the document. Shingling a document is making the set of all K shingles of the document. So as I said, you know, if, if uh, the document is of length N, the first shingle would be the substring going from uh, character zero to K minus one. The second will be one to K, the third two to K plus one, etc. And before we shingle, you know, um, we need to do some pre-processing on the documents. Pre-processing might involve such things as, uh, you know, extracting text out of HTML, uh, because you don't want to have the HTML tags as a part of uh, uh, the processing. And you may replace uh, any white space uh, with just one space character, et cetera. And you may t you may want to remove punctuation marks, you know, new line characters, things like that. So uh, the the idea of Jacquard similarity on sets of caching goals is to determine which pairs of documents are similar by having a cutoff threshold. And uh, size k is something. Uh, that you will decide based on, you know, what makes sense. Um, so in the example that I have here, I have size k equals, uh, I think it's six, you know, we, we'll get to know when we go through the code. Uh, if k equals one, then um, most of shingles will be in most of the documents. It doesn't make sense to have k too small. And k cannot be large also. If it's large, you know, you may not find any uh, documents, any pair similar at all. And the application of uh, this would be, you know, uh, if you have a, a large corpus of documents, you know, you, you it's easy to find out pairs uh, that are similar. You know, like if you want to just have a document and see, uh, see if, if somebody mimicked your document or somebody took large parts of it from yours. Uh, uh, if you have any copyrights over that, you may want to go after them. You know, this this is one of the uh, applications. The other application would be, you know, to identify mirror sites. Uh, for example, when you Google, uh, you know, for a particular download, the download lists a, a bunch of mirror sites. Uh, uh, but, but Google may want to just present with you uh, just one site because, like, if there are 100 mirror sites, you know, if Google comes back with uh, uh, 100 listings, you know, your page will be filled with just one download, and you'll have 100 of them, you know, different mirror sites. So, so Google would also need some algorithm to identify document similarity. And you know, I think Google does a very good job. You know, like it, it just gives you one one link, and you know, it, from from within that link, you'll be able to identify the other mirror sites. So uh, alternatives would be, uh, you know, you could uh, use words instead of characters. So so k consecutive words, let's say, you know, would be a shingle. So uh, working with uh, strings, string comparisons will be very slow. So that's where we, uh, the, that's where the challenge comes in. And shingles can be hashed to integers. Uh, so if you work with integers, they're faster. 
and all we need is a good hash function. Now this again, a repeat of what I said, you know, uh, even if you, uh, if shingles are hashed integers, since, uh, I mean, if each integer takes about four bytes, uh, you're talking about four times the size of the document uh, for each shingle set, you know, or for each document. And that's not also something that we can easily work with, if you, even if you have a million documents. So that's why we need some more reduction uh, in, in the, the data that you work with. So this is again a repeat of what I said earlier. Uh, if you have n documents, the number of pairs will be n times n minus one by two. And if you have a million documents, you're talking about half a trillion pairs, uh, roughly. So, okay. Now, so, so the, the path, as I said, as I uh, told you in the, uh, in the big picture, uh, so the, uh, the way we, we proceed is to find a way to represent shingle sets with representative smaller sets. And the second thing we do is uh, if we can identify a much smaller subset of pairs of documents we could work with, then, you know, that would be good, you know, uh, locality sensitive hashing algorithm that we present will actually do uh, the, uh, uh, the second desirable that we have. Okay, so let's get to min hashing, the, f the first of the uh, algorithm. We, we can replace shingle set for each document by a signature of fixed length. And uh, min hashing algorithm gives you uh, a way to rep replace the shingle set by a signature of that. And, uh, and that'll give you, um, well, comparing signatures will, will, will be better, but that, that's not, uh, that doesn't give you precisely uh, the required results, but you know, you, you, it gives you a result that's very likely true. Now, this is just a uh, representation. Be before we actually proceed, you know, we need to have uh, a conceptual view of what we are doing. So, if you have shingles uh, for various documents. You collect all the shingles from all the documents, order them, and then you have them written down like this, H1, H2, H3, you know, going all the way to all the shingles that you have uh, collected from all the documents. And then you have document IDs, you know, like S1, S2, S3, uh, till the number of documents that you have. And in this matrix, you will have H1 uh, row and S1 columns entry as one if H1 is a shingle in uh, coming from this document S1. So uh, as you can see, this is a very sparse matrix because the, the set of all shingles will be very big if you consider uh, just one document, let's say, you know, S1, you will only see ones here where, where you know you actually have a corresponding shingle, and that means most of these entries are zeros except for a few. Similarly, if you if you look at a record uh, going this way, uh, a row in a row, most of the entries will be zero because a given shingle will, will only be in a small subset of documents. So this is a sparse matrix, and doesn't, it doesn't make sense to have zeros represented, or you know, it doesn't make sense to have uh, space allocated for the zeros. So, so if you can represent this matrix in such a way that you don't have to allocate space for zeros, uh, you know, that reduces the storage quite a bit. 
So representing uh, a sp sparse matrix, you know, is is one of the keys here. So, well, this is just a repeat of what I just said. So the the matrix basically is, is sparse. So you have shingles going this way and documents going this way. And a, an entry in the matrix is one. If you have if you have a, a shingle in that specific document and zero otherwise. So even working with this kind of a matrix is is, is uh, difficult because the data still is very big, and uh, that's where we we would do a min hash. So so here is what min hashing does. I, ideally, this is what it should be, but what we do is something different. Uh, min hashing is basically this: uh, if you order the um, set of rows as uh, as rows headed by shingles, uh, you you would pick up a large permutation of the rows. I mean, you would pick up permutation of the rows and permute the matrix accordingly. And once you have the permuted matrix from each column, find the row that has a leading one. That means uh, if you pick a column, you, you need to have all the entries above that column as zero, and uh, and that particular row, uh, I mean, all the entries above that row as zero, and uh, that particular entry in that row should be one. Uh, I'll, I'll just start tell you what I'm uh, what I'm talking about. Like in this, let's say you know this is your permutation, and once you permute it, let us say this is the matrix you get. Now. The, the min hash value for uh, this column is one because, uh, or, or zero, because in the zero row you basically have a one. So for the second column, for or for the second document, the min hash value would be zero, one, two. So it's two because in row two you have a one, and Similarly, for this, the min hash value is zero, and the min hash value for this is one. So, so, so what we are talking about is, given a permutation, you permute the matrix, uh, you permute the rows of the matrix, and then read off the num row numbers for each column you have, where you have a leading one. Uh, so that gives you a min hash value. So, so basically, let's say if you have permutation going this way, let us say uh, this was the first row, this is the second row. Uh, well, uh, l l let us say, okay, I, I think I, I gave you a different view, but, but anyway, the idea is the same. Uh, you have a matrix, and let us say this is your permutation. So your row one goes here, row two goes there, row three, row four, etc. Uh, now in the permuted matrix, for uh, for this column, for column one, you basically have zero in the in the first uh, uh, first column, and uh, I mean in in the first row, uh, and you basically have one in the uh, second, so the min hash value is one here, uh, etc. I, I hope you get the idea. So, you, so basically you permute the rows, and for each column, you start from the top, uh, go um, look for a leading one, and read off the row number. So that's your min hash value. And the challenge here is, uh, uh, okay, I mean here you know you basically have three permutations, and and for each of these permutations you you're just making a set of uh, 
min hash signatures. So, so three permutations will amount to uh, three min hash signatures. So instead of this whole thing, this whole matrix, you'll be working with these signatures, and each signature is of length three in this case. And why is um, why is that why is it done this way? Uh, it, it's easy to see that the probability that Jacquard similarity of SI document SI is same as Jacquard similarity of SJ uh, is is equal to uh, the uh, the Jacquard similarity of the min hash uh, values. So that means uh, the probability that a random function, random min hash function, produces the same value on two documents is equal to the Jacquard similarity of the two documents. Now, if you work with multiple min hash signatures, uh, you will actually get closer to the uh, Jacquard similarity. So, so if you min hash enough number of times using random permutations, the set of min hash values generated for a pair of documents will be the estimate of the Jacquard similarity. Now, min hashing involves picking up a random permutation, and how do you pick up a random permutation? You know, you, you would, uh, if you look at the number of permutations uh, of a set of size n and that's n factorial. n factorial will be a very large number even if n is 50, you know. And so generating that many permutations and and, and picking one is, is not feasible. I mean, if n is uh, running into, uh, let's say, tens of thousands, uh, there's no way you can get to a random permutation. So, so what is done is actually we uh, we replace uh, a random permutation with a random hash function. You know that's how it's done. Now this is a little involved. I mean, uh, you know, you, you probably will not get it at first go. So so what we the algorithm for min hashing goes this way. So we will pick n randomly chosen hash functions h1 to hn on on rows so when i say rows you know you're talking about row numbers so if you have uh, number if the number of shingles is let's say 1000 uh, you're talking about numbers going from uh, 1 to 1000 and you're looking at hash functions which will hash those numbers from 1 to 1000 now consider a, a, a signature matrix. Um, so l let us say you're looking at uh, n uh, as the uh, as, as the number of uh, uh, signatures that I mean uh, n as the number of shingles that you're looking at, and uh, capital N as uh, the number of documents. So initially set signature I C, uh, I'm sorry, N is the number of uh, signatures or number of hash functions, and capital N is the number of documents. So, so, so this is the matrix that we want to fill out in order to get uh, the min hash signatures, where each column will represent a signature uh, related to that document. And so, so, so what we do is we initially set all the entries to a large number. Well, by infinity, we mean just a number that's greater than the number of shingles. And for each row, we'll just do these two things. Compute h1 of r. H, h1 is a hash function. r is a number between 0 to uh, 1,000 if 1,000 is the number of shingles. So, so you're looking at the Im uh, image of this uh, this number r under that hash function h h1, 
Similarly, image of R under hash, hash function H2, etc. And for every column, you would do this. If C equals 0 in row, do nothing. If C equals 1, then for each 1 to N, um, set signature I, uh, signature value IC to be the smaller of the current number. Uh, and HI of R. So once once you do this, you you are basically uh, left with a min hash matrix, and uh, min hash matrix is is what you're looking at. So if if you choose uh, your signature length to be n, you are getting a min hash uh, min hash matrix of uh, n. Uh, by the number of documents capital n um, and that's uh, that means you know a large single set got replaced by a signature of size uh, lowercase n yeah. so that's quite a reduction and that's what min hashing is you know i mean i i will have this uh, this presentation uploaded somewhere uh, since this doc, this algorithm is, you know, it takes time to actually uh, to get a grasp of this. But uh, you know, if you need, you know, you can go back to the presentation and then look at it. So once you're done with this, uh, you will have min hash signatures available. And locality sensitive hashing is is done because of this. You have a min hash signature matrix. Uh, that means you have uh, min hash signatures, uh, like let's say lowercase n, and and uh, the number of columns is the number of columns uh, is the number of documents that you have in your set. And uh, if you have a million documents, and if your signature size is 25, you are looking at a 25 by 1 million. Uh, integers. So that's the size of the matrix you're looking at. And that is still really very big. Um, so uh, so what we do is we we try to eliminate uh, pairs of documents that don't need to be checked at all. Or uh, alternatively, what we do is we identify candidate pairs from this set that are likely uh, to pair up as similar document pairs. So so what we do is, um, again, uh, it, it's, it's, the idea is simple. Let us say this is your min hash, uh, min hash uh, signature matrix. So the, uh, the rows here are uh, your signature numbers. And then the columns here are the documents. We break this matrix up into bands, so R rows per band. And so what we do is we look at uh, for for each. Uh, well, we pass through each band once, and while we pass through that, we look at each column here, each little uh, sub column here, and we hash that to uh, some number of buckets. So we have a hashing function going on each of these bands. And uh, two documents are similar if you basically have at least some of these bands uh, matching completely uh, or are getting very close. Uh, in most cases, you know, matching completely. So that means, you know, if two numbers here, uh, like some entries in this column uh, versus entries in this sub column if they match completely the hash functions will match them to the same bucket so you run hash functions on these sub columns band after band and uh, if uh, two particular documents get into the same bucket you know they are candidate pairs so that's just the idea so, so this is what it is. So let's say, in this case, for this second bucket, 
you're looking at this and and this. So you got two two document IDs here, and so they become your candidate pair. Similarly, uh, this document and and this document they hash to the same bucket and they are candidate pairs. Now, so so this basically is your hashing. Um, hashing, uh, I mean, locality-sensitive hashing. And what you'll be left with is a very small set of pairs of min hash signatures. And once you get the pair, you can, you can run the algorithm uh, against the corresponding shingle sets that you started with. And then a certain, uh, if that pair uh, has the same uh, Jacquard similarity as you would want it to be. So, so you know that's that's the idea. Now, just to summarize, the method of determining similar pairs of documents in a collection of documents goes as follows: so you pick a value k, and that will be uh, your uh, size of a shingle. So you'll construct k shingles and hash the cache shingles so that you have a smaller representation of the cache shingles. And, uh, um, and pick n, the length of min hash signatures, compute min hash signatures, and pick a threshold on similarity for documents to be considered similar. And, uh, you know, you, you can show that, you know, the, the number of bands that you actually have uh, in each uh, well when you cho when you actually band the when you break up uh, your min hash matrix into a set of bands can be given by this formula where b times r is actually n the number of uh, min hash signatures and construct candidate pairs using locality sensitive hashing and once you have a candidate pair, see if the candidate's pair, candidate pair signature agree on a proportion of components equal to T, or directly look into the shingle sets uh, to assess the similarity. So, so that's what we did so far. And I'll, I'll show you uh, the process diagram before I get into the code. Um, uh, the process diagram shows, you know, what actually uh, is implemented. Okay, I need to zoom in on this, I guess. Okay, uh, so before I, I, I think before I get to even this, I, I need to show you what's the data set uh, that I'm working with. Um, so this data set, I just got it from the internet. You know, it's, it's a public data set of some discussions forum. And uh, you know, it, it was a dump taken before the uh, the discussion website went out of uh, business, I guess. Um, so I'll just show you. It's just a dump of a lot of HTML files like this. So you have posts by different users, and I consider each one of these as a document. So this is basically uh not representative of a typical document size but you know this is just an illustration of what we can do with spark so so this is what i have you know we basically have each one of these as documents so before i work with uh before i shingle these things we have a lot of processing to do we have to scrape this html uh get these these texts out of it 
and I would also remove the new line characters, uh, any other special characters, and things like that. So I have a pre-processing module uh, written in Java, uh, which does the pre-processing, and then it produces uh, it, it produces a file. Okay, I just need to I need to locate the file. Let, let me. Let me show you what I produce right after the pre-processing. I'll, I'll show you, uh, you know, the pre-processing code also. It's, it's, it's a simple thing. Um, please bear with me. Eclipse uh, takes a little while to load up. Maybe I have it. So if you have anything to say, please unmute yourself uh, using star six. And uh, you know, if you have a question, you can just let me know. I don't know if the code is visible. The fonts may be too small, but I, I'll just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm opening this just to locate my input file. Oh, okay, so I didn't have to go there. So this is what I have. Um, for some reason, it doesn't open in a text file. Let me open it on a notepad. Uh, I have just put about eight lines here, so I, I can open a bigger one as well. So the uh, that text that, that I scraped from that dump looks like this. I have a I create a document ID for each record that I read, uh, and I I strip off all the new lines and some special characters from the text, and for every document I just create one line. So. And this is uh, this I need to do, you know, in order for me to have um, data fed into Spark RDDs. So, so that's the format uh, that is uh, fed into the into Spark. Now, this file is loaded uh, on HDFS, and the Spark that runs on the Hadoop cluster reads from that. So, so let's uh, let's get back to the uh, process diagram. Uh, so, data from files um, is is made into an RDD. For for this, uh, for for just illustrating this, I will use just one one file coming out of uh, the output of the preprocessor, and that that has about 500,000 lines. And for the complete data set, uh, the number of lines I get is about seven and a half million. So, so, so that means, you know, if I run it on the whole data set, uh, I'll be doing about seven and a half million uh, uh, document pair processing. Well, seven and a half million documents uh, processing. Now, data from files will be 
will be just uh, fed into a Java RDD. I've used Java here. Uh, you know, I think that uh, I would use Scala as the next one, next uh, thing. I'm more familiar with Java, and I'm currently learning Scala, so I'll uh, probably have this implemented in Scala eventually. Um, now that's the basic RDD that's, uh, that it reads from when the, when the file is read from HDFS. And so we do one mapping, and we transform this into an RDD with a document ID as long, and then a sorted set of shingles uh, as, the, as the other. So you basically turn this into a set of key value pairs where key is document ID and value is the set of uh, sorted shingles. So th that's what we get. And we transform that into, um, so, so for each document ID and sorted shingle set pair in this step, uh, we do a flat map and so what we do is, uh, what, what flat map does is basically it stretches out the, uh, uh, it, it maps each item in, a, in an RDD, each element in an RDD to more than one element and it, it makes that collection as a larger RDD, RDD. So while I do that, I also switch the, um, the position of the document here. So, so I basically get another uh, RDD where I have a shingle mapped to, uh, well, sh shingle as the key and then document ID as the value. So this is to uh, get a representation similar to the matrix that we have. Shingles as rows and documents as columns. So this is uh, that part. And um, so, so, so the next step is basically for, for every, sh so basically if you have a shingle in about 10 documents, so in this step you're looking at 10 of those elements in the RDD. And we want to group them together so that it looks like the matrix we are looking at. So I'm just grouping by the uh, by the shingle, and then so I get a shingle here and an iterable long. So basically, this gives you the document IDs that actually contain the shingle. So that is this RDD, and and the next RDD that I have here. Um, now I'm, I'm just using an index. I, I just want these to be indexed. So instead of working with shingles, I, I'd want to work with shingle IDs. So this is just to create uh, shingle IDs. I'm just uh, using uh, an RDD method called zip with index. And so, so what I get eventually is uh, you know, shingle ID mapped to document ID lists. So so I have a long, in this case, the, this long here is a shingle ID, and the iterable long here, the array, the, the list that you're looking at that this points to is, uh, is document IDs. Now that's one part of it, and, and now uh, we are ready to uh, min hash. Um, so we have the matrix of shingle IDs and document IDs, and now we are ready to min hash. Uh, for min hashing, uh, this is what I did. Uh, the first step I did is I, I just wrote a function to generate primes, prime numbers up to a million. Uh, that's a simple function. And uh, Select n random primes. So, so instead of selecting uh, n random hash functions, I, as a first step, I select 
uh, n random primes from that list. And I use each prime to uh, define a hash function. So that way I have n random hashes. Um, well, I think uh, uh, my notation, this should have a lowercase n. You know, I'll, I'll correct that sometime. Um, now, I from this, I, I use the min hash functions, and I have the algorithm there that creates the min hash value, uh, min hash value pairs. Um, and once I have the min hash value pairs, uh, I use the local addition to hashing. You know, uh, local sensitive hashing algorithm that I have is is very simple. So for each of those uh, uh, sub columns in each band. I just add up the min hash signatures, and if the if the some of those uh, min hash signatures match, you know, I just put them in a bucket. So that's all I'm doing there. And I'm not sure if that's a very good hash function, but uh, you know, things uh, you know, I could change this to a better hash function if some I get something better. Now, so that completes the uh, algorithm. And uh, I'll just uh, walk you through the code. Um, now, now, what we saw is just the pre-process. Um, So this is the Java class uh, for implementing this algorithm. Um, now I, I have the serial version ID. I need to have this in order for the framework to transmit the, cla the, 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 uh, the classes in the jar file to other nodes and have them run on the other nodes on HDFS. So this is needed while you are running on a distributed system. And so, so these these methods that I have here are are basically um, well. This is just a display, you know, just for debugging purposes. And I have a method that takes a sorted uh, set of strings, which are uh, shingles. It takes a it takes two sets, and it'll tell you whether they are uh, similar. It, it just gives you the jacquard similarity. And now this, uh, well, we don't use this in, in this because we are we don't really go checking the jacquard similarity between the sets. Uh, this function is used uh, in the code here. Uh, what this does is it uh, it generates a set of shingles given a document. So uh, I had an alternate uh, method as well for generating set of shingles. I didn't use that. Okay, now the main method goes this way. Um, for outputting the data, I have a set of files. Now, now this is uh, basically the input. Um, and and I output the data in uh, a bunch of uh, locations. And I have two sets of these. Um, the first set is to actually have this, when I compile this and run it on my uh, laptop here, I use this. And I, I, I usually recompile the whole thing with this set. Now these, uh, these parts that you see here are HDFS parts. So when I run it on, on a yarn cluster, I use, uh, I, I uncomment these, recompile it, and you know, uh, so that, that, that's used for running it on, on, a, on a Hadoop cluster. So, so 
So you start by setting up an application name, uh, sparkconf dot setup name, and um, you create a Spark context object. And so I'm using just one data file here. I could basically produce a whole directory of files for this, but uh, just for this, just to make sure the runtime is not uh, too bad. Uh, you know, I, I just uh, I've just used this. Now I have one file. Uh, in this case, you know, we are looking at about 500,000 uh, document IDs. So I create uh, a Java RDD from that. So this is the 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 step one from this from the data file. I create the Java RDD. And from that, I now this is the function that uh, generates uh, shingle sets out of each document, and it makes a document ID and sorted shingle set pairs. And from that, I. Uh, I, I think I have not used this part, so let me skip that. I, I use a flat map, so this is the next step. Uh, the flat map is basically uh, this part. So you use use a flat map to uh, make uh, you know shingle sets pointing to document IDs. So you want shingle sets to be rows and document IDs to be columns. So that is done with this method. And I have all this code posted on, on GitHub. Let me, uh, well, the GitHub is actually, um, GitHub location is on my uh, blog site as well. So I mean, uh, I, I'll not go through all the code. You know, like you, you can you, you can just click this link and get to the GitHub location. So I mean, you can view the code here as well. It's the same code. And and uh, to to reach that, you know, you just uh, have to go to my blog, kumarvn.wordpress.com. Uh, I'll, I'll send out the link right after this meeting. So if, if you just go there, uh, you'll see the link. And you, you also have the link for the pre-process as well. Now, so so this is basically the, uh, this basically is the Java code uh, that implements the algorithm. At the end of it, you'll basically see uh, a bunch of bucket IDs followed by a list of document IDs and that list of document IDs will have pairs, you know, that are similar. Now, now let's r run that. Um, I thought I thought I'll be able to finish this in less than an hour, uh, and then get to uh, I'll get to running this right after. But it took a little longer. Okay. Um, So I, I'll just run this on my uh, my laptop once. Uh, I have compiled this, and and the jar file uh, is sitting at this location. So that's the jar file. Now, when you when you run the jar file, uh, you have two options. Uh, when you deploy it on a Spark cluster. You can create a jar file that has just your classes, and and in that case, you have to have uh, the the complete uh, library that it needs. You know the yarn libraries and all that on every every node, and that has to have pointers to all of that. Now, instead of doing that, what you could do is you can create a 
uh, Uber jar, you know, which which is it's an executable jar. Uh, it it has all the libraries that it needs, just packaged into itself. So you don't have to worry about uh, making sure all the nodes have the uh, libraries in the right paths and all that. So what I have created is just that Uber jar, uh, and it's about 86 uh, you know, MB. Now the other lighter jar would be just 16 kilobytes or so. You know, so that's the difference. So I, I work with this so that I don't have to worry about the settings, the path settings, the class path settings on each node. Uh, well, before I get to Hadoop, you know, I'll just uh, run this uh, on my local machine. So, okay. Um, I need to show you what I have in the in the script that I run. Um, so this is the script that I'm going to run. So it just has a setting for Java Home. And uh, since it uses uh, Hadoop libraries, you know, um, Hadoop 2.6, I need to make sure I point to those libraries as well. And in the class path, I have the location for the jar file that I have built. And Uh, the Spark Home, you know, the installation of Spark. So when you install Spark, when you want to run it on your laptop, uh, there is a Hadoop free Spark version that you could uh, uh, you could run. Uh, so install the Hadoop free version, and uh, you know, just put the class, uh, put the Spark Home as uh, that location, um, and and that's about it. And you you basically run by by the spark submit and your class um, master local tells you that you're working locally on one one machine and that's it any errors will go into error dot txt now before I run that in I had to make sure I clear out these uh, these directories from an uh, from an earlier run, otherwise this fails. Okay, let me delete these uh, directories. So, okay, it's it's going to run for just a couple of minutes. Uh, while that runs, you know, I can log on to. Uh, Amazon AWS because uh, this is the one that's going to take some time. I don't run the full-blown version on AWS cluster for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is uh, I don't have a uh, cluster with uh, uh, with big machines. So what I have is four instances of T2 small. You know, it, it's not a large configuration probably has about uh, two gig RAM and things like that. So so let me uh, start up. Like I, I have these these four nodes here. Uh, uh, I, I created the, these nodes uh, a while ago, I mean a few months ago. Uh, I have a Hadoop name node, a secondary name node. Uh, in fact, I don't need a secondary name node, but I just have it in place. And then I have two uh, slave nodes.
So I'll just start this up. While that starts, let's see. Okay, this this job is still running on my laptop. So, um, well, after I run, uh, after I'm done with my uh, Hadoop cluster, I usually shut down all the machines there, so that you know I, I don't accumulate charges on that. So, uh, so when I uh, when I restart the cluster to to get connectivity through Putty or something, I need I need to uh well i i need to actually reassign my reassign the public ids the public ips of those uh, machines so the public ips get reassigned so that's uh, i'll do do just that now so that's uh, my putty console um name node on aws so this IP that I have here on my putty configuration was from an earlier session, and that's not valid anymore because I started the Hadoop cluster now, uh, and I I need to put the new IP address. Uh, now the private IPs they don't change. So so when a cl uh, when an when a machine in the cluster talks to another node in the cluster. Uh, they're okay, you know. They, when when I have the settings of uh, which nodes are slaves and all that, you know, I have them as uh, uh, machines with, with their respective private IPs. So, so from within Amazon AWS, these uh, cluster, uh, these IP addresses, the the private IP addresses don't change. But I, when I connect from outside, you know, these things change. So I had to make sure uh, yeah, I, I put the new IP addresses in uh, in order to connect. If if this is getting too long, you know, just let me know. You know, I'll uh, I'll try to cut this short. You know, it's going to take another ten or fifteen minutes, I think. So that's the machine for, uh, so I, I logged into one machine, so I need to do this every time I start this up. Uh, otherwise, if I can have permanent public IPs, you know, that's at, at a cost. Uh, I, I use this only during weekends, so, or you know, sometimes alternate weekends, so I, I don't really need these to be up and running all the time. So, okay, let me get to the second note. So that's my uh, secondary name node. So I need to bring up slave one and slave two.
So those are the four machines I have on Amazon, A, Amazon EC2. Uh, now that's the name node, that's the secondary name node, that's slave two and that's slave one. Now I, uh, before I run the program, I need to start the uh, start Hadoop yarn. So I do this, I have this configured already, so I just go to, uh, I have Hadoop installed in Hadoop SBIN, uh, this directory. So, so all that I do is I run H, uh, the DFS and the yarn together. I just put that in one command here, separated by a semicolon. So, so when you go to a slave node, you can see that data node just started. This is a part of uh, uh, HDFS. And by the time this is done, you should also see a node manager. So this is a part of yarn. And um, if you go to secondary name node, the process that you'll run are uh, just the secondary name node. And uh, on on the primary node, you will see node manager and resource manager. I mean, name node and resource manager. And on slave nodes, you will see node manager and the data nodes. So, so name node on the master will work with data nodes. So this is a part of HDFS and resource manager on the master will work with node managers on the slaves. That's a part of uh, YARN. And secondary name node is just a backup for uh, the name node. So, so the, if, if this name node doesn't have any issues working, you know, secondary name node does not have any role. Now, uh, in order to have Spark use Yarn, I need to have uh, uh, Yarn Conf there in my, uh, I mean, in my in set of environment variables. So, so I just uh, use that. I just set the variable, and. So uh, now that HDFS is running, you know, I am just listing the set of directories I have on HDFS. Uh, output is where my output is going to go, so I'll, I'll remove this, otherwise uh, Hadoop will not overwrite and it will cause uh, an error. So I'll just remove the existing uh, output folder. Okay, so now if I do, so uh, output folder is gone. Now, in order to do uh, Spark submit, you know, I, I just need to go to the Spark directory and run that. I mean, I, I don't have, uh, you know, uh, nice, shell files yet that actually runs this from one place. So I just had to go to the corresponding directories and run these. So so here, the, if you look at the command, you know, you basically are uh, doing the Spark submit. You know, that's what takes the uh, jar file, I mean, the class in the jar file and, uh, uh, and runs the uh, process on the, on the cluster. So you're just uh, saying that this is a yarn cluster. And when you say it's a yarn cluster, you know, it looks for this config, uh, yarn config directory that uh, uh, we, we actually talked about earlier. So I have set this variable so it knows how to get to the yarn cluster. And number of executors is actually two. So this is the number of Spark executors on each node. Uh, this is something that you can vary depending on the amount of RAM you, that you have and things like that. So each one of them 
will run in a separate process, I believe. Uh, so uh, in, in a separate JVM, I think. Um, I'm not sure of that. So, I mean, you can tweak these, but for my uh, cluster, two basically happen to work right. So, so I'll just run this. Uh, So it takes the command, runs, it produces an output, uh, which which is same as the, which is similar to the output that I would see on on my local machine. Now let's get back to the local machine. Now this is the one that I ran from the DOS prompt. Now it did, um, it, it completed. The number of shingle IDs mapped to the uh, document list, so that's about 919,000. So that means that many shingle IDs. And uh, document ID min hash value pairs uh, count would be uh, 19,930, and they are listed in uh, in separate uh, documents. Look, each one of these. Uh, corresponds to a band. I have my, uh, if, 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 let's go back to the code, you know, I'll just show you how much, uh, how many uh, elements I ha how many min hash, uh, min hashings I do. So I have a shingle length of six, min hash signature length is 24. I just wanted a 24 so that, you know, I can break them into bands of, uh, you know, six each. So, so uh, LS oh, bands of four. Basically, LSH block size is four. And now, LSH bucket size. This is basically the uh, for LSH uh, for the locality sensitive hashing algorithm. The number of buckets I use for hashing. So uh, let's go back. Look at the output. Um, so this is the output that got generated. Now each one of these corresponds to one locality sensitive hashing bucket that I have. Now this is the file that's created by uh, by Spark. So. What I have here, you know, uh, is not something uh, very readable. But but what you have is this. This basically is the hashing bucket ID. So what I did here is in in the code that I I see the number of locality sensitive hashing buckets is nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine, and that means you know these numbers range from zero to nine ninety nine and so in that bucket you know I got two documents hashed so the that pair can be checked for document similarity and for this uh, hashing bucket I have four documents that means y you you basically get uh, how many uh, six six pairs that you could compare and etc you know so these are the smaller sets so uh, you, you don't have to worry about comparing the list of documents here with the list of documents here so that's quite a lot of processing reduced now we can go back to amazon cluster and you know we we will find a similar uh, result here So it created a directory output, and so if I look at it, created these files again. Um, now, for, for just for, just for convenience, you know, I just uh, 
you know, you know, you know, in order to save time, just pulling these files out. I just copy these files into a local folder. Okay, so so it's it's similar results. I mean, because uh, you know you have the uh, same. I guess it's identical results. I'm not, I don't know if I use the same. Yeah, it's, yeah probably the order is different. Uh, okay, so so this is what it is. I mean, this is the implementation of the algorithm, and. Uh, you know, I, I'll just uh, unmute everyone, you know, so that we can just have a chat. Okay. Now, what we can do next is, you know, we can put a lot of uh, stuff around this. So when we say these two documents are candidates, you know, we could just have uh, the documents themselves listed or pointers to this listed and things like that. Uh, or we can just go verify if they're really similar and then print out uh, the documents themselves. In this case, posts post from the, uh, well, from, from the uh, you know, discussion website. Now, uh, the other things we can do is we could actually use a uh, streaming, Spark streaming algorithm. Uh, that's one thing we can do. Uh, you know, th there are other things that we can think about. So, so if you have any uh, questions or comments, uh, please let me know. Hello, anybody there? Uh, I, I think uh, you, well, I, I, I unmuted everyone, you know, if you don't have to do star six. If you did, you know, you can do it once more and you should be able to talk. Okay, so I, I guess uh, I've either put everyone to sleep or <laughs> so nobody is able to get to me. Um, okay, so uh, well, we'll conclude this uh, this presentation. You know, if you have any questions, uh, you can email me. Hello, Kumar. Oh uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, Kevin. Oh okay. So I just want to see if you can see my screen because last time I remember you asked me to install one SQL mobile Xterm, right? Uh, oh, yeah. uh, mobile. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know if, it, if this has a mobile version. Uh, do you want to make uh, make you the presenter? I mean. I mean, I installed. Oh, so right now you are a presenter, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I can mm. I can pass the presenter role. Do you want to show something? I mean. Yeah, yeah. I want to see if you can see my screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, do you want to do this later, or do you want to do it in this uh, in this meeting? Oh, it doesn't matter because right now no one talks to you. So <laughs> just Oh okay, yeah. okay. Sure. Yeah, I, I just passed it. Can you accept it? So I didn't see it. So uh, you didn't, uh, 
Oh, download. Oh, okay, I have to download the application. Oh, is it? Okay, okay. Just one second. So right now. Thank you. 